Physiotherapist, the continuing care team worker, the occupational therapist, even a dietitian. This has come from all varieties of. I went to visit. I took it upon myself to visit the school because I met a parent once I was at hospital, and I was totally out of my depth. Didn't know, and they just left. She came out of hospital, and you just sort of left on your own. So when I met this parent, it was like, oh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. It doesn't mean that Madeline and we're just going to be left stranded, floundering. And she said about her school and um, the school that her son went to, and there is help out there. You can get portage. I wasn't even told about portage at the time. Um, and I just thought, well, I've got nothing to lose. I'll go and visit this school. I'll have a look around. I'll find out some things from other parents and then I was introduced to Portage I went, and then I got the physio care and through me talking about the school saying I went to visit it, then it was like, oh, the numbers are dwindling or oh, they've only hardly got any children in that school, it might not be kept open. So was that NHS then? Not We, we, we live in a democracy, people are entitled to say exactly what they think to anybody at any time and if those conversations have been taking place there's not a real great deal this committee can, can or can't do. As I understand it, we're being asked to come to a decision whether we consult on the closure and other options of Lindale School and no final decision has been made so I just need to, to be clarity around that. And we're not here to discuss the options and we do the best, okay? Right, I'm going to let you go. All right, Michelle, thank you very much indeed.
you would label the wind if you like. And thankfully, um, Lindale School picked him up very, very quickly and offered on the same place at Lindale. During his five terms, he did school plays, he did sports day, he went swimming, and he was included in every activity that that school had to offer for my little boy. He did drawing, he did painting, you name it, my little boy did it. And for the terms previous to that, so for four terms previous to that, he was excluded from pretty much every activity. Now, I'm here today to say, without Lindale, my little boy would not have had the experiences that he was given. And yes, his schooling years were very, very short, sadly. But he would not have had those life experiences that he got from Lindale School had he not had the opportunity to go there. My little boy had a medical need as well as an educational need. And for four terms of his school life, he was denied that. I was a question about you talk about some of the activities that, that you know, your child engaged in. Yeah. I think one, one of the questions that I, I, I was forced to pose, and maybe a bit more to the professionals, at what point do you believe the numbers within a school and the age ranges would make those sort of activities almost impossible? I mean, you know, in theory, if, if the numbers simply kept dwindling, but, and I'm not unfortunately blame why they're dwindling, but the numbers kept dwindling. Maybe the, do you believe there might have been a tipping point in terms of numbers where you know, activities such as the, the thing that every child expects could ever take place? In theory, you know, if the tipping point's one, then it'd be one child in the school and a whole regime around it. Is, is there a critical number in your mind where it wouldn't feel like a school, but like, you know, go No, no, to be honest, I think, certainly from Anthony's point of view, he was very much on one-to-one. -one. He had to have one-to-one. My son had up to 70 seizures a day. Um, one of the reasons why he was excluded in other activities. Um, they were dealt with while he was at school. So no, from a personal point of view, I don't think there is a limit. <laughs> Do you feel that the uncertainty over the closure of the school over a number of years will have contributed to the decline of numbers? Yeah, because as I said, I, I, I know Michelle said before that you know Lindell wasn't a school that was offered to her. It wasn't a school that was offered to me either. It was one that I had to go out and find. Now, the school that Anthony went to after his mainstream <coughs> school in his low level um, care, his low level special educational needs school that he went to first, was the other side of the road to where I live. Lindell was on my doorstep, and it wasn't offered. Just a quick one. Thank you for your very positive uh, contributions to the and I'm very sorry to hear your problem. Just two very quick questions. What do you think it was about Lindale that made it so special? I, I think you suggested it in some way by what you said, but can you just summarise what do you think was so special about the way that your child was treated in Lindale? Well, they, were, they, they included him. He was not excluded from anything at all, and every child in that school is included. Um, they're all treated as individual people um, and they had the medical support that they needed. And in order having to said that, do you not think it would be possible for another school that we don't know that exists at the moment that could provide the same level of service? Is that not a possibility? I think you're possibly excluding the fact that because Lindale might die, uh, there might be other schools that could provide this service. Do I'm not, not saying that there wouldn't be other schools that could provide that service. I only know from a personal point of view, my son went to two different special educational schools. One could not meet my son's needs, and one did above and beyond what I would ever expect from a school to provide for a child that had special educational needs as well as medical needs. I certainly accept that, and your fear would be that at another school there might not be that kind of support. That would be but a huge it's an unknown fear. question. We don't know that for a fact. What we're doing is suggesting that based on your experience, you feel that that probably would be the likelihood of it happening in the future in the school. Well, 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to name schools as to which school my son went to because I don't think it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. But the school that my son went to before he went to Lindale, I was phoned that although he was in there for term, I was phoned every single day because my son had a seizure of one sort or another. Now, Anthony had seizures going right from tiny little absences that lasted seconds right the way through to tonic chronic seizures that lasted hours and anything in between that spectrum. And I was called to the school every single time we had a seizure. I you actually couldn't go away from that. Now, whereas at Lindale, the only time I ever got a phone call from the nursing staff at Lindale was when he'd had a big seizure, he'd gone into stasis, he was fast asleep, and they called me and told me, like, this is the situation, you have the right, obviously, I had the right to go in there if I wanted to. But they dealt with the situation, um, and I was safe, and Anthony was safe. And I knew that you know he was being cared for, and his mother was being met. Well, th thank you for your courage in coming here and telling us your story. I think it's been most uh, informative, and thank you for that. Okay, clear. I'll make sure the last question. Uh, it's just a quick question um, about process, really. Um, when um, Anthony uh, was sort of in the schools, who is it that advises which special school it might be in the child? I mean, obviously his needs fully identified uh, for a while. But who would advise, say, Lindale or Emily Park or Stanley? Who is it that does that? I was basically told where Anthony was going to be going initially by the, by the, by the education authority. When Anthony went to the state meeting process, I was told which school he fitted the criteria for. So when a child is taken to the family council who basically tells you where your child is going, my understanding at the time, and obviously I am going back 11 years when Anthony was taken to it, was my understanding was it went to a board, a panel, of, a board panel, and they said, right, you know, he's low level, medium level, high level, um, and at the time he was taken to as low level need. Well, actually, he was very much high level need, so therefore, you know, his needs were never going to be met. Okay.
we are able to learn their many ways of communicating. Whether it's something as subtle as that movement of the little things to the stamp of the foot. We su successfully do this by our homeschool diaries, communication passports, and most importantly, we have a very open door policy. Some lessons may be done with the children still out of their wheelchairs, supported physically by one or two members of staff. For other lessons, the children would need to be hoisted back into their wheelchairs, taking the same time as before. However, this is not as straightforward for some of our children. A little boy, for example, is very hypersensitive to touch and movement, and he becomes so distressed during these times. But the patience and reassurance given to him from the staff that know him helps ease his discomfort and enable the staff to carry this task out safely. Most of our children cannot swallow food or fluid safely. They are fed via a gastrostomy, which is essentially a hole in their tummy, which leads directly into their stomach through what is called the Mickey button. A tube is attached to the button, and fluids are slowly given by a feeding syringe or a pump. Before any feed is given, it has to be prepared and set up. This is to ensure the syringes are clean, extension tubes are primed, free of air, and the correct feeding dose is measured out. Each feed lasts a minimum of 20 minutes to give, and for one child, this procedure takes up to an hour. All school staff at the Lindale School are trained in this gastrostomy and pump feeding because it is a natural part of our school day. 75% of our children are fed in this way, and this is carried out alongside their learning. <coughs> one little girl who is tube fed suffers from very painful tract wounds which caused her great distress. To relieve the pressure and pain, the teaching assistant in her class will bend her. This involves attaching a syringe to her gastrostomy tube and massaging her stomach. This helps the pockets of trapped wind to escape from her tummy, out of the tube and into the syringe. This can take up to an hour to do and will need to be done during several times during the day. Lunchtime is a very important social part of our day. It's a chance for us all to come together as a school and enjoy each other's company. While some of our children eat, others are being fed by their gastrostomies. It's an opportunity to communicate with the other children and to enjoy watching the new skills that they have learned. An example of this is watching a little girl feed herself with a spoon independently, when only a very short time ago the thought of anything near her mouth would cause a very great distress. It's times like this that we appreciate the skills and patience and care given by our fellow colleagues. Our children can't always indicate to us that they need a pad change. For some, their pain threshold is very high and they would become very sore if left for any length of time in a wet or soiled pad. For others, their medical and dietary needs can cause them to have frequent and acidic bowel movements. This can then lead to a painful breakdown of their skin. One child in particular regularly needs changing up to five times in one day, each time requiring two members of staff to hoist and change. A number of children require a suction machine to help clear their secretions and prevent any life-threatening chest infections. Many of our teaching assistants are trained to carry out and are able to set this up by cleaning and maintaining their pieces of equipment. We are also fully trained to support children who require oxygen we can assess if a child's oxygen requirement changes throughout the day and can safely manage their environment so that they can still fully participate in the lessons. Another child is on a portable life support machine. Although he is supported by a member of the continuing care team, which is NHS one-to-one -one care, school staff are there to assist in times of medical emergencies if his tracheostomy tube in his throat blocks or comes out. They are trained to manually pump air in his into his trachea using an ambi bag to keep him alive. Whilst his carer pre prepares to perform an emergency tracheostomy tube change, the strong bond we share with our children allows us to make him feel safe and reassured in this very serious situation. Throughout the school day, many of our children will have a number of different type of seizures. In each class, the staff will recognise the type of seizures that their children have. Some are more obvious than others, 
but some may be so subtle that they require very close monitoring and observations by all the staff throughout the day to confirm them. Not only can the seizures impact on the children's learning, but often the medication that helps to prevent them can infect them too. We recognise when a child is affected by either seizures or medication and can adapt our lessons accordingly. These are some of the basic fundamental things that we are very highly trained to do. We prioritise to ensure that our children stay healthy, safe, comfortable and ready to learn, which, as teaching assistants, is our aim. If you come to our school, you will also see our children having lots of fun, swimming, dancing, accessing technology, playing football with Liverpool Football Club, riding on specialist bikes, cooking, creating, to name but a few. Our high staff ratio ensures that the children's education and safety is never compromised, while school staff are looking after their medical needs. We also are committed to the fun and education of all our children. Our children can and they do learn, and this is obvious to all that know them well. As teaching assistants, we help teachers to plan and deliver the lessons using our knowledge of each child to set realistic and achievable, achievable targets. We support the children physically, emotionally, and work together as a very close team with, with outside agencies, which includes nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and speech and language therapists. The children are not taken out of any lessons for therapies as we work alongside them to maximise the children's lesson times. This is a very, very small glimpse of a typical but very busy day within our school community. We hope that you can appreciate the ethos and the aim of our school. Sadly, as you've heard, some of our children only have a very short life expectancy. We contribute to them having the best experiences and the most happy memories, as well as being a very consistent support for the families. We hope that you now have a better picture of a typical busy but enjoyable day at the Lindale School, and thank you for listening.
whether a consultation uh, process should be supported. Obviously, you, you would be part of that consultation process. Um, do you feel yourselves that you um, have an input into that consultation process? Obviously, some of our parents are concerned that, that well, in their words, they, they have no faith or confidence in a consultation process. How do you feel your views might be shared for uh, I would fully support that from we had a staff meeting with Julia Castle um, and basically we have had the list of the options 